Hi, my name is Robin Cox, and uh, I'm going to be talking about software-defined radio in uh, neutral atom quantum computing, and hopefully the title of the talk will make sense by the end. So I have a lot to cover in the next half an hour. I'm going to try and uh, provide some background for what we're doing so the use of software-defined radio makes sense. So I'll start out by talking about what is a quantum computer, why you might want to employ neutral atoms to make one, uh, how we go about creating quantum computations using neutral atoms, and the answer is with lasers. And uh, what, uh, more specifically to software-defined radio, the classical control system electronics that are involved in controlling the lasers, and how specifically we're using SDR and, and new radio in our control system. So starting out, what is a quantum computer? Uh, quantum computers uh, employ co a computational model based on the principles of quantum mechanics. And they, first, uh, they were first postulated in the 70s and 80s when people began to realize that processes dictated by classical physics, i.e. classical computers, uh, cannot be uh, uh, simulated, cannot simulate quantum mechanical processes in tractable timeframes. So uh, people asked themselves, can we make qu uh, computers using quantum mechanics to solve these problems? So, both classical and quantum computers can be expressed in terms of a uniform set of reversible circuits. So we're all familiar with the classical computing model where you have binary bits and set a set of universal gates in which you, whereby you can implement any Boolean function using only the gates in the set. And for instance, NAND and FANOUT are, two, are, are a set of universal gates for a uh, classical computer. And the quantum analog is a qubit and uh, some quantum circuits. So qubits, um, and uh, so let me just start out by introducing some terminology, like what's a qubit. So uh, the qubit is a fundamental unit of quantum computation, and the physical realization of a qubit is a two-state quantum mechanical system. So we're taking advantage of, in quantum co computing, of the somewhat mind-bending oddity of quantum mechanics, and that a qubit is actually a coherent superposition of both the zero and the one state. Uh, and when I say superposition, what I mean specifically is a complex linear combination of those two states. Sometimes you'll see in popular science literature, people say uh, a qubit is in both states at the same time, and that's not strictly correct. So uh, qubits, th this, this kind of complex linear combination is more, is very precisely expressed kind of mathematically in terms of this notation you know, alpha associated with the zero state and beta associated with the one state. These are called probability amplitudes, and they're complex numbers. And the, these probability amplitudes, because they're complex numbers, can both constructively and destructively interfere. And the relative interference, uh, the interference, the degree of interference, I should say, is quantified by the relative phase of alpha and beta. And this, uh, the qubit actually collapses to one of these two states, zero or one, only upon measurement. So uh, this picture uh, denotes something called the Bloch sphere, which is named after a Swiss physicist named Felix Bloch, and it's a very convenient geometrical representation of a qubit. So the, the operations on qubits, these logic gates that I was uh, talking about before as being the fundamental units of a quantum computer uh, can be quite conveniently visualized as rotations by an angle theta about the three axes of this sphere. Uh, a phase shift, which would be tracing a horizontal circuit, uh, circle around the sphere, and something called a C naught gate, which actually requires two qubits. And uh, it performs the naught operation on the second qubit, provided that the first one or the control qubit is in the one state. So bear, keep, this, uh, keep this block sphere in mind because it, it will help explain what I'm about to go into when we get uh, in terms of manipulating these qubits. So uh, just the, the operations on the qubits can be represented by rotations on the sphere. Um, so what fundamentally are we doing with a quantum computer? So we're start, the inputs to a quantum computer are registers of qubits in an initial state and the circuits are effectively interfering the components of the input according to a predetermined quantum algorithm that's programmed into the computer. 
And the magic of quantum interference results in the cancellation of all these probabilities except for the correct solution. I say these words and it's like the more you think about it, the more your mind is blown. Like it, it, but the quantum mechanics is, is, is uh, actually makes much more sense mathematically than when you try and say it in words. But uh, one of the fundamental, uh, another kind of weird uh, consequence of quantum mechanics is when you have multiple qubits, they can be, you can, you can put them in so-called entangled states whereby the combined state has, contains more information than each qubit individually. Uh, so you need at least two qubit gates to take advantage of this entanglement, hence a two qubit gate being a, one of the fundamental building blocks of the quantum computer. Um, you might have heard of quantum teleportation, whereby you can impart information from one to entangled qubit uh, onto another, regardless of physical separation. So people have uh, thought about using this phenomenon for uh, key exchange, for instance, and encryption. Um, and entangled qubits can also enable the, the generation of quite random numbers. So, uh, you know, you, there's been a lot of uh, news about quantum computing lately. And uh, the one thing we sh should make clear is that quantum computers are very well suited for, pro you know, the types of problems that take very, you know, intractable amounts of time on classical computers, but are not going to completely replace your laptop anytime soon. And if you're interested in uh, some more examples, this uh, IBM page has a, a good list. I'm not gonna, I, I have a lot to get through, so I won't uh, talk about the examples specifically, but um, the, there are numerous applications for quantum computing that people are starting to look at. So why use neutral atoms with quantum computing? We haven't heard much about neutral atom quantum computers until quite recently, but they do have some, uh, several distinct advantages. Notably, um, Neutral atom qubits have very long coherence times compared to some of the alternative approaches, upwards of 10 seconds. So when I talk about coherence, I mean the ability to actually do useful computation with a qubit. So uh, one of the things that you, you'll hear about when people talk about computing, quantum computing is fault-tolerant quantum computers because when you have uh, uh, things that are perturbing the quantum system, they can, essentially, they can effectively collapse the qubit and decohere the measurement, which we don't want. Um, so we have chosen to use uh, arrays of identical atoms that we cool and trap with a laser in an array. And so we don't have to deal with like semi semiconductor process variations like uh, people making superconductor qubits have to because we don't have to fabricate anything. Uh, we have chosen strontium, which is an alkaline earth element. And uh, strontium and and some of the other alkaline earth elements uh, have uh, an atomic level structure that's quite conducive to, to quantum computation. Uh, we can actually operate our system at room temperature so we don't need huge dilution refrigerators or liquid helium. Um, we actually read the system out by taking images so we don't need dedicated electronics for readout. And uh, neutral atom qubits are actually s smaller scale than semiconductor qubits and in principle we can uh, the number of qubits we can uh, attain in our machine is only limited by the amount of laser power that we have. So all of this is brought, brought to life through the magic of lasers, magnets, and atomic physics. So there's a lot of information on this slide. So I'm just going to kind of summarize what we're doing with the lasers and the magnets. And basically, it all comes down to we need SDR to control this thing. So uh, we're, we're creating our... Uh, our, our array of strontium atoms by baking them off of it, boiling them off of a block of strontium in an oven. And then we use la a, a laser beam that's propagating uh, uh, in the opposite direction from the atoms traveling down this path uh, into the, into the uh, region of interest to, to slow down and cool the atoms. Uh, we're using magnetic fields to, to trap the atoms in an array and uh, then we use them to uh, split the atomic energy levels into closely packed substates so that we can individually address the atoms with lasers and manipulate them into the states that we need for our qubits. And then uh, we actually use lasers as well to uh, do state-specific readout of the qubits by exciting uh, the qubit 
that's in the zero state, for instance, into an excited state, and then when it decays back into the ground state, it emits a photon, which we then detect with a camera. So we need very specific uh, laser frequencies, and in order to get the atoms to behave the way we want to, uh, we need to precisely control the duration, frequency, amplitude, and phase of uh, a large suite of lasers in our control system at nanosecond timescale. And we need RF pulses to do that, and hence software-defined radius. So this, this just basically summarizes what I, uh, what I just said. So we're making a single qubit. We're cooling the atoms. We're isolating them in optical dipole traps focused by laser beams. Then we're cooling them some more. And one, one point that uh, should be made is when we fill the array, on order, only on average about 50% of the sites are full. So we can fully fill the array, the computu computational region of interest, by moving atoms using, uh, using the laser and RF pulses from outside the region of interest inside the, uh, into the empty, empty spaces in the array. So we have a fully filled array. And I'll show an example of that. Uh, in a minute. And then once we have our array, we need to be able to address individual atoms and construct our gates and uh, perform our quantum computations. So how exactly do we make a qubit with a strontium atom? Well, I will, uh, essentially what we do is once the strontium atom is trapped in its trap, uh, we are taking advantage of the fact that we are applying a fixed magnetic field. Um, so there is a magnetic moment of the nucleus uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, okay, let me start again. So um, we have a strontium atom in the ground state, we apply a magnetic field, the magnetic field splits these ground state energy levels, and we take advantage of two of them to create our single qubit gate. And we, uh, we actuate the gate uh, through an, uh, an off-resonant coupling uh, to coherently rotate between the zero and one states on the sphere. And so we use a laser to, uh, to two laser beams, one to excite the one, this, uh, uh, the one state into an off-resonant excited state, and then second one to de-excite it to the other state. So we can... Uh, create a, an X gate, which is a pi rotation around the X axis and flopping from zero to one with these two laser beams. So that's, that's our one qubit gate transition. And for two qubit gates, we take advantage of the fact that strontium atoms are so-called Rydberg atoms. So what a Rydberg atom is, is you can excite the strontium atom to a very large principal quantum number using a UV laser. And so in this case, the laser has a uh, wavelength of about 317 nanometers. And the Rydberg atom has this very bloated electron cloud. So the electrons kind of expand out like this. And so the net effect of this bloated electron cloud is it has a, a dipole, dipole interaction with its neighbor such that it shifts its neighbor's excited state to a point where this laser cannot actually uh, it's the, its neighbor's uh, excited energy level is off resonant and it cannot reach this state. And this uh, phenomenon is called a Rydberg blockade. And we can take advantage of the Rydberg blockade to create entangled two qubit gates. Uh, so it, it sounds crazy, but it does actually work. Um, so now that we have our one and two qubit gates, um, in our uh, neutral atom quantum computer, how, how do we actually use it for computing? So um, here is a diagram of our, our, of our stack, and the control systems group is down here. So we're, we're kind of manipulating the, the atoms with our SDRs. Uh, higher up the stack, uh, that we have, uh, we're also at atom computing working on a language for, specific, for specifying these quantum circuits called Klingon. Uh, so it allows allows uh, people using the apparatus to string series of quantum logic gates together to form algorithms at a higher level. Um, so the, the the members of the control systems group are basically the non-quantum engineers. Um, so uh, essentially, what we're doing 
is representing our quantum circuits is RF pulses. So the area under the pulse determines exactly how much of our population we transfer from one state to another. And the shape of the pulse has a huge effect on the performance of the gate. So we really, so the SDR needs to very precisely control the amplitude, phase, and frequency of this pulse. Um, so we're, how do we use a software-defined radio to create a one qubit gate? So I talked about this, uh, this uh, process to, to, trans to, to, to go between um, zero and one in the, with our qubits. Uh, and so the way we actually uh, actuate this is by, by running a laser beam through an something called an electro-optic modulator, which essentially imprints the frequency that uh, an RF frequency onto this laser beam and in the frequency domain uh, kind of gives it the, this frequency kick that's necessary to uh, bump these atoms to this virtual excited state and back down again. And uh, so in practice, the SDR uh, is using, uh, because we, uh, the, we're using the dialing RF SOC, so it uh, has a maximum output frequency of six gigahertz. We need external mixers, so we have, and we have two laser beams, so that's four DAC channels. Um, and the other thing we need to be able to do is selectively address the uh, trapped atoms with RF tones. And so we use this, we, we do this through this uh, uh, device called an acousto-optic deflector, and essentially what it's doing is it's uh, trans translating the, frequ the frequency of tones applied to it into deflection angles. And uh, you can, when you have two of these cross devices, you can individually address all the atoms in a 2D array uh, by just applying uh, multiple tones to this, to this AOD device. So some of the enabling technologies for this uh, SDR that we need are, uh, or this programmable pulsar, it is effectively, effectively a wired SDR. And so uh, we can also use software divine radios to monitor laser frequency locks. Uh, that, uh, and uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, so since w at the time when we were designing the system, there was no cost-effective com cost commercial available SDR above, that could transmit above eight gigahertz and we need closer to 10, we're making our own. And in addition, uh, we need the control system to be scalable and replicable because we do have plans to build uh, additional computers in the next two years. So uh, we took advantage of the fact that there, uh, that in particle in particle physics, uh, the micro TCA standard, which is a derivative of the telecom uh, advanced TCA standard, uh, has been uh, widely used, so we can, uh, there are many commercially available FPGA cards that we can uh, use, and there's a, many open source hardware designs that we can modify for our purposes. And we're also using uh, electron multiplying CCD cameras that are uh, commonly used in astronomy as well for, and uh, other scientific imaging for, to image our, our to read out our system. Uh, so again, we're addressing one qubit gates and we need eight DAC channels. So very conveniently, there are eight DAC channels in an RF SOC. So our system includes uh, an RF SOC and some uh, two uh, marquee mixers for up conversion for the electro-optic modulator channels for the, one, the two lexes of one qubit gate. And we've implemented a custom waveform generator in the, the programmable logic and in the ARM core of the RF SOC. So uh, we're, uh, the, the AWG is in CPU and FPGA and RF land, and these EOMs and AODs transition to the lasers to manipulate the atoms to uh, create quantum co uh, computation. So the architecture of our uh, Hapixler SDR, and it's called Hapixler because it's named after a Canadian, a mythical Canadian lake monster because two of the guys who worked on it originally are Canadian and that's what they named it, so it's stuck. Um, the architecture of our device is quite similar to you know, most SDRs. We have you know, the, the DAC, the RF chain out here. Uh, we have uh, some of the 
the waveform player, which uh, is capable of creating uh, linear, linear waveforms, single tones, uh, ramped and chirped waveforms, ramps that are both linear and nonlinear, and arbitrary waveforms like those Gaussian pulses that uh, we need to, uh, to uh, actuate the one cubic gate. Um, those are all uh, FPGA blocks. And then in the ARM core, we have a uh, gRPC server, uh, which is running in C++ and it's implemented in C++ and Rust. And that is receiving commands from the host PC uh, from the higher level languages that specify the gates that are compiled down to the pulses and uh, some digital triggers that we need. So this is an example of some of the types of commands that might be sent to the gRPC server, like setting the frequency, triggering, uh, you know, arming some digital triggers, um, and then playing out the waveform. So we can have multiple waveform players because for, for in the case of the uh, control, the AODs, we need multiple tones per DAC channel associated with one DAC, and they're encapsulated by this module called a channel manager. And uh, we also have a, um, a digital trigger manager that's responsible for triggering uh, external, external devices like laser shutters and the imager when we want to take a picture, et cetera. Um, so here's an example of what, what uh, the instructions look like to, uh, to program this thing. And you know, we send trigger words. Uh, periodically with durations. And then, so you specify, for instance, you specify, you know, say wait for trigger and then specify the frequency, specify um, uh, what you want the, the phase and, and uh, amplitude profile to be, and then off you go and out comes the pulse. Um, so the RFSOC also has eight ADCs, which are originally put on the chip for, you know, to act as like a receiver for a uh, base station, for instance. But we're actually using them, we're, we have DC coupled them, and we're using them to measure photodiode voltage outputs that scale with laser intensity. So it's like massive overkill for the RFSOC ADC, but they're there and it works, so we use it. And so we uh, use the ADCs as an input to a, PI, a digital PID controller to amplitude modulate the RF DAC outputs. And this capability, uh, has a the bandwidth of the digital servo is is limited by the latency of the uh, of the ADC FPGA DAC path, but it's typically hundreds of kilohertz to a megahertz, and this functionality is being uh, integrated into our, our system kind of basically right now. It's a new feature. Um, so the reason uh, why we're doing we're developing our own SDR is. Uh, the picture, this picture on the left is a, uh, what our system looked like before. It's, it's a kind of collection of commercial boxes. The, each of these boxes is you know, two, two RF channels. So every time we want two more RF channels, we need to add another box. Uh, there's this kind of trigger patch panel, which is coming out of ribbon cables at the back of these boxes. We have these uh, analog uh, PID controllers that uh, only handle one channel. So again, if you want another channel, you'll have to add another box. So this is not a very scalable model, but it was good for our, it was, worked fine for our prototype. So what we've been doing is uh, in our, you know, we're designing this uh, SDR to be, to be a micro TCA card, but we're prototyping with a dialing CCU 111 RFSFC eval board. And it's actually lurking down at the bottom here. So what we're doing is we're gradually adding functionality uh, to Pixlr and, and decommissioning these, these uh, commercial boxes one by one. And so the, the end goal is to replace that entire rack with a micro TCA chassis. And uh, every time we want eight more channels, we just add one of these cards. So this, this is our SDR card. We actually are using our RFSOC system on module because uh, it, it made the design a lot simpler. Um, and then the way the micro TCA chassis is uh, constructed, we can have uh, mezzanine cards coming out the back. So this is our digital trigger board coming out the back. Um, I like penguins, so these are named after two of the penguins of Madagascar. And uh, this board actually exists and this board is getting assembled right now. So 
here is uh, a pixel or an action. So I mentioned that uh, we can actually pick up atoms from outside the region of interest and move them to fully populate the array. And uh, I don't, it looks like the animation's not working, but uh, what, the anima what this bottom anima animation is showing is a single atom that's being dragged across the field of view of the camera by these ramped RF pulses coming out of the pixlr and spelling out the word atom. And this, this movie actually uh, is uh, showing a, par a, a partially filled array becoming fully populated over time. So uh, that is another kind of fun application and very useful application of our SDR. Um, the other thing we're using software-defined radio for is we have this device called an optical frequency comb in our system, and it's, a, it's an erbium-dope fiber-blocked laser uh, with a spectrum that's made of discrete equidistant frequency components. And essentially what that is is at the ultimate frequency reference. So when I say mode lock, what I mean is the laser outputs femtosecond scale optical pulses in the time domain uh, that are separated by the round trip propagation time in the laser cavity. So in the frequency domain, you have, uh, you know, for some reason the picture didn't uh, render, but you have uh, very evenly spaced uh, spikes in the frequency domain that are excellent frequency references. So the way, we can use this thing to keep all of our lasers locked and uh, by essentially beating our lasers against this, uh, mixing them with the uh, optical frequency comb and the bead frequencies uh, are in the 28 to 100 megahertz range. So they're right in the sweet spot of a USRP. And uh, I just should mention that this frequency comb uh, won the Nobel Prize in, in physics in 2005. And one of the students of the Jan Hall, uh, the Nobel Prize winner is our scientific advisor at Atom Computing. So we are we're taking advantage of uh, our, the, the fact that uh, USRP N210 and a UBX40 is right in the, the, the sweet spot for the beat frequencies to uh, measure the beat notes of our, la of our lasers take an FFT. Uh, and what we do is we measure the uh, power spectral density uh, in band and offset a few megahertz away. And we calculate the ratio of integrated powers and we see if the power ratio is decreased and uh, we detect that with the USRP. And if the power ratio is decreased, we uh, change the current set point. And uh, this feedback loop keeps the lasers locked for a long time. So this. This apparatus is called LAMA, Long-Term Laser Locking and Monitoring Apparatus. So no uh, talk at GRCon would be complete without a flow graph. And this is a very underwhelming one, but it does have uh, Mike's correct IQ block in it. We're not actually taking the uh, FFT uh, in, in this GRC block we, when we were originally uh, prototyping. We, we did, but uh, the, the FFT is now actually being run on the host PC and uh, it's being fed into our real-time environmental monitoring display. Um, so this, we actually ha ha have an Osmocom source in here instead of USRP source because we started out using a hack RF and then decided that a N210 would be uh, better suited for this application. And so uh, this, Somewhat underwhelming flow graph has increased the uptime of our lasers to order weeks when it was they they came out of lock every few days before we installed this thing. Um, so that is that is it. Uh, we are hiring software and FPGA engineers. Uh, and if you have any questions about the physics that I glossed over or any other questions about our system, I'll be around and I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Are there any questions from the audience here? There is. Uh, hi, Robin. Thanks for the presentation. Hey, I, I was looking at the diagram for the RFSRC and I noticed that some of the DACs you are using external mixing versus the internal 
mixing. Can you car uh, can you comment a little bit about the difference between those those two use cases? Yeah. So for the uh, the the DAX without the external mixer, let me just find a slide. Um, those are driving the AODs, and I one of the the things I failed to mention is the AODs tones that we're outputting are in the range about uh, 80 to about 400 megahertz, so you can directly generate them out of the RFSFC. Whereas the EOMs in the modes that we are uh, operating in to uh, transition between the two states of the one cubic gate require nine to 11 gigahertz tones. So we need to upconvert because the RFSFC's maximum output frequency is about six gigahertz. Makes sense, thanks. Great. Uh, we have a few online questions and then I'll jump over. All right, from Arthur Lobo. What is the coherence time of neutral atoms, neutral strontium atoms, or what is the coherence time of a neutral strontium atom quantum computer compared to superconducting and trapped ion quantum computers? What? Well, it's much longer. Uh, and what, what that effectively means is, uh, is the qubit can be used for computation for, um, you know, for a much longer period. And uh, mm -hmm. so for neutral atoms, it's in the tens of seconds. Uh, the superconducting transmons, it's 10 to the minus four seconds, so the operations have to occur much, or be executed much faster. And for uh, trapped ions, it's in the hundreds of milliseconds. All right. And next one, are the neutral atom qubits susceptible, susceptible to cosmic radiation? Um, I su that's not something that we thought about, but I suppose so. Uh, I mean, any, perturb any perturbation could in principle decohere the system and would result in us having to use error correction. But uh, I don't think it's our primary uh, source of uh, worry, like things like temperature variations and electromagnetic interference and the lasers being unstable are far larger effects. Uh, so question about the software architecture, I noticed that you all use Rust. I was wondering uh, if there was a particular reason you chose it and whether you had any regrets about that choice. Uh, so the the server was originally written in C++ and it was okay, but uh, the Rust was actually more of an experiment than anything. It's the first piece of code that we've written in Rust. And uh, so far, uh, the performance is great. Well, we have no complaints. It is, a, I, I can't tell you exactly how much faster it is, but it is faster. Uh, and it was kind of our first foray into using Rust in a, embedded application, so stay tuned. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. If you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll shuttle the mic during the answer. This might not be the most intelligent question, but I'm just curious how you use lasers to cool something. Oh, that is actually a very good question. Oops. So <laughs> essentially, what, what's happening is, is so the, the atoms are propagating down kind of a channel from the, from the oven where they're boiled off from the block of strontium. And there's a laser that's uh, propagating the opposite direction, which is at, it, at a frequency that is a specific, that excites the atom into an excited state. Uh, and you know, so you've got the momentum factor slowing the atom down and cooling it. But also when the, ex the atom in the excited state decays back into the ground state, uh, it emits the photon isotropically. So, it, it's, so you'd think you'd kick it into an excited state, it would make it like actually not cool it, but the opposite happens. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's not, I'm not an atomic physicist, but that's my kind of understanding of, of uh, how the cooling is working. <laughs> So th this is a comment that I think basically attaches to this, but uh, folks have seen most quantum computers having like room-sized coolers. Uh, the, this laser cooling is the alternative to that? Yes, yeah, so we can use lasers to cool and cool atoms, and uh, you, can, you, you can also cool them through, 
by trapping them in essentially a potential will. So they, through, if you put them in the right state with you know, magnetic fields that are trapping them in one place, they can't move, so they can't heat up either. Um, but you know, we don't need a cryo system, but we can use one and it can actually uh, help us, but we don't need like the, the cryo systems to the scale of the superconducting device. Great. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you very, very much.